So, Kim, what's on your radar? Well, over the past few weeks, we've been covering the organization Time's Up and their shift away from their mission statement of holding the powerful accountable to instead behaving like a political operative running interference for the Democratic Party. They'll take down any man who abuses power so as long as that man isn't a powerful Democrat up for election against a Republican. But Time's Up isn't alone. Several other organizations have shifted away from being based on a set of principles to instead fighting as hashtag resistance warriors. One such organization, and the most disheartening to see, is the ACLU, once revered and simultaneously even despised for taking on big government forces on behalf of marginalized groups. In recent years, the ACLU has shifted its focus away from being from protecting anyone and everyone's freedoms to, in some cases, downright limiting them. This can be seen, this can be witnessed most recently in their current fight on behalf of mask and vaccine mandates across the country. The ACLU is arguing that mandates actually further civil liberties. Referring to their battle in South Carolina, the ACLU tweeted, quote, students with disabilities are effectively being excluded from public schools because of this ban. Courts must intervene. This is a disability rights issue. Prohibiting schools from taking reasonable action to protect the health of their students forces the parents of children with disabilities to make an impossible choice, their child's education or their health, unquote. The law in no way prevents an individual from wearing a mask to protect themselves. Students who are the most vulnerable can show up even triple masked if they desire. Pre-COVID times, students who were immunocompromised particularly and particularly vulnerable for whatever reason, be it a recent organ transplant, being HIV positive, or any other number of illnesses that result in a weakened immunity, they took precautions for themselves rather than place the burden on their peers. They did not require their fellow students to mask up, glove up, or wear any other protective of gear in order to attend classes. But it seems the ACLU's new stance is that everyone's liberties must be limited because of the few who need theirs to be. Thus, everyone being limited together is an advancement in the fight for civil liberties. They take the same stance in regards to vaccine mandates. In an op-ed published in the New York Times, the ACLU argues, quote, in fact, far from compromising civil liberties, vaccine mandates actually further civil liberties. They protect the most vulnerable amongst us, including people with disabilities and fragile immune systems, children too young to be vaccinated, and communities of color hit hard by the disease, unquote. Forcing everyone to wear a mask and take a vaccine certainly would be equitable, I'll give them that. But no matter where you stand on the debate, it's hard to understand how one could think forcing millions of people to take a drug or wear a mask is furthering civil liberties. Even if you argue it's for the greater good and for the benefit of community public health, you still would be hard pressed to make a case that denying medical choice and freedoms is somehow liberating. In 2008, during an avian flu scare, the ACLU released a pandemic preparedness manual where they argued the exact opposite of what they are saying today. In the manual, they cautioned governments from using coercive mandates and law enforcement tactics to control a virus, saying, quote, rather than focus on rather than focusing on well-established measures for protecting the lives and health of Americans, policymakers have recently embraced an approach that views public health policy through the prism of national security and law enforcement. This model assumes that we must trade liberty for security as a result, instead of helping individuals and communities through education and provision of health care, today's pandemic prevention focuses on taking aggressive, coercive actions against those who are sick. People, rather than the disease, become the enemy, unquote. And they go on to say that, quote, effective preventative strategies that rely on voluntary participation do work. Simply put, people don't want to contract smallpox, influenza or other dangerous diseases. They want positive government help in avoiding treating disease. As long as the public officials are working to help people rather than punish them, people are likely to engage willingly in any and all efforts to keep their families and communities healthy, unquote. Now, this clear shift in message is really confusing. What changed? The ACLU, inching towards a more partisan posture, began nearly two decades ago. But a full pivot happened in 2017 after the ACLU defended white nationalists' right to rally in Charlottesville. 
After the rally turned violent and Heather Heyer lost her life, the ACLU dramatically changed course and circulated an internal memo stating that the group would be more selective in which cases it would take, saying, quote, Although the government may not discriminate based on viewpoint, the ACLU, as a private organization, has a First Amendment right to act according to its own principles, organizational needs, and priorities, unquote. In fact, the organization's most infamous case is National Socialist Party of America versus Village of Skokie, where the organization represented a group of neo-Nazis who were seeking to march through a Chicago suburb where a significant number of Jewish Holocaust survivors resided. Jewish ACLU attorneys defending the rights of neo-Nazis caused many to recoil in disgust. But the mission of the organization had always been clear, to defend the rights of all Americans, no matter what their ideological beliefs were, to be principled in that defense, even if highly unpopular, and even if the outcome of winning such case would result in an undesired event, such as a Nazi parade, or in this recent case, kids not wearing masks in schools. The ACLU has taken on the powers that be time and time again, no matter who the power is and which side of the aisle the power is coming from. The ACLU had for decades divorced itself from political ideology. They weren't defending Nazis or hippies or commies or racists. All they cared about was defending the Bill of Rights. From defending unpopular people during the Red Scare, to anti-war hippies during the Vietnam War, to Nazis wanting to parade, to minorities wanting equality, the ACLU took them all. But the days of, the, of a principled ACLU seem to unfortunately be behind us. Speaking to the Washington Post, Faz Shakir, a Democratic political advisor who was serving as the ACLU's national political director at the time, said the organization had shifted to become, the, to become opposition to Trump and his agenda. He cited the organization's massive growth in members since 2016 from 400,000 to 1.84 million saying, quote, people have funded us and I think they expect a return. So there you have it. Even the ACLU isn't immune to being beholden to donors. And I get it. The organization has to run and needs money to do it. They received a wave of new do donors during the years of Trump. In fact, in their annual report since 2018, they touted themselves as being part of the resistance. And in, in an attempt to keep the money flowing in from these new anti-Trump donors, the ACLU has had to take up fights that keep them happy and dismiss others which would be considered offensive. And in the end, our democracy is worse off for it. The ACLU now refuses to argue for things such as the religious freedom of evangelicals or even pro-life Catholics. They have stopped defending due process for accused rapists and the freedom of speech for anyone they deem to be too far right. Now, you might, morally, you might be morally against what these groups stand for or who these people are, but when rights are whittled away for some, they ultimately get whittled away for all. The ACLU of days past knew this. They understood that even the unpopular needed to have their rights respected, that being a truly free society means all people of all ways of life and thinking must be free from government censorship, blacklisting, coercion, and control. But now they seem to be falling into the same trap as Time's Up, an organization with good intentions that's desperately needed that you can now count on only about half the time to do what is right. Now, Robbie, I know that you even talked, you even wrote about the ACLU and how they've even uh, seemed to, they, they've stopped defending due process. Uh, I mean, do you think that this organization, I mean, over 100 years this organization has existed. They have fought for people on both sides who were extremely unpopular. And now in the last really two decades, really since Trump more so, the organization has shifted. Do you think there's any getting it back? Or do you even see another organization potentially coming in to take its place? Yeah, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who were affiliated with the ACLU during its more kind of robust free speech due process phase. Uh, Wendy Kaminer is one. She was a board member and she's become a, 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 a something of a critic. Um, you know, the, the, the other aspect of this, it's not just that you talk about the, you know, the donations they brought in as part of the rebranding to be this anti-Trump organization. It's also the employees. It's also the, the, the young uh, attorneys who have joined the organization 
see it as an anti-Trump, anti-Republican organization. I, I'm sure the, the, the older st the staff members of the ACLU who have been around a long time would love to stick. Most of them would like to stick to its commitments. But you bring in these younger people. And this has been the story at a lot of, you know, a lot of organizations being kind of taken over by woke type stuff. You know, I don't mean to use that pejoratively, but they they want a different mission. They want a mission that is more partisan and, and you know, that doesn't defend Nazis or and of course, we're on board with mass and vaccine mandates. That's the cool, popular thing to do if you're a very progressive person. So that's part of the story is grappling with they're, they're going to have complaints from employees if they pick dangerous fights. And that's going to that that forces organizations to backpedal. And uh, and and there's no there's no easy or good solution to that. You have to recruit different people. But then that's going to make the people who work there mad. Um, I think, yes, it, it might be the case that a different organization has to arise. Um, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which is an organization that's also been around for not nearly as long as the ACLU, but it's been around a while, um, has, has taken up so much legwork in defending college students' free speech and due process rights in the manner that the ACLU did until very recently. So, so issue by issue, other organizations need to pick up the slack. Yeah, and Kim, I think you put your finger on something really important here. And the, 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 as we become so polarized around partisan politics, the institutions are going to have to fight harder mm -hmm. to, to live, by, live by their principles, or they're going to be pushed in the direction of whichever way they, they have a lean partisan-wise. So you know, a ACLU has always been kind of nonpartisan, but it, 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 leaned to, it leaned to the left. And so if, if it's going to be pushed, it's going to go all, it's going to go all the way there. And if, and if, and if people don't, don't fight to say no, like what, there's nobody else that can really do this. I mean, a lot, you know, you could, you could try to seed a new group, but it will instantly kind of take on the stigma of just being a right wing Nazi defending group. And so then it, it loses the cachet of what the, of what the ACLU had. And so what, what I just don't quite understand is of all of the different places that somebody could go to work, you know, if you don't believe in the ACLU's mission, why go to work at the ACLU? Go, go work, go work somewhere else where, where you can, you know, act out the values that, that you have rather than going in there and, and changing the values of the ACLU. Because if, if that's what you decide to do, you better be damn sure that you're doing the right thing because you know you're taking mm -hmm. down an institution that as you said has existed for a hundred years and and can't very easily be recreated so you better be right about what you're doing yeah. yeah it's unfortunate to see the demise of this organization go in this way you know i mean it really we really need them especially in a time when we're talking about a lot of censorship and uh, I mean, it's like, where is the ACLU? This is the time that we would need them. But it's really unfortunate to see them go this way. But again, 400,000 donors to 1.84 million. Uh, right. That's a and huge difference. Exactly. And it's not even about whether they're right, whether Nazis, like, it doesn't mean that they support Nazis because right. they defend the right to march. And it doesn't mean that you have to be opposed to a vaccine mandate, you know, to, to want an organization out there who's going to make the, the legal and the ethical arguments on, on that side. You know, a society ought to have to grapple with those rather than just being able to steamroll them into place. And don't pretend, don't, you know, try to tell us that 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 vaccine mandates and mass mandates are enhancing civil liberties. Maybe they're necessary. Maybe it's a trade off right. that has to be made. But right. it's certainly right. it's right. a trade off that cuts against civil liberties. Not a, that's just ridiculous. Uh, coming up, right. Team Rising is here to discuss all the latest developments coming out of Texas. Stick around.